You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios. I'm looking to make a drama out of a crisis. And there was definitely not just Phyllis's personal crisis, but luckily for me, the backdrop is also quite critical because it's the run-up to the American Revolution. Welcome to episode 377 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. And I'm your host, Liz Covart. Although the official United States commemoration of the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution won't take place until July 4, 2026, the 250th anniversaries of some of the big and important events of the revolution are already taking place. For example, December 2023 marked the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. It also marked the 250th anniversary of the arrival of Phyllis Wheatley's published book of poetry in the British American colonies. Phyllis Wheatley was an enslaved African woman who, as a teenager, became the first published African author of a book of poetry written in English. Ade Sholanka, an award-winning playwright and screenwriter, has written two plays about Phyllis Wheatley's life to commemorate the semi-quincentennial of Wheatley's literary accomplishments. So in today's episode, we're not only going to explore the life and times of Phyllis Wheatley, we're also going to explore how playwrights use and research history to help them create dramatic works of art. Works of art that can help us in the present form an emotional connection with the past. Now during our exploration, a day reveals information about Phyllis Wheatley's early life and the cultural origins she came from in the Senegambia region of Africa, how Wheatley was able to write poetry as an enslaved teenager, and how playwrights like Ade use the work of history and historians to create dramatic works of art that can help us view and understand the past in new ways. But first, I could really use your help. The Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios team and I would like to know more about you and what you think of Ben Franklin's world. This podcast is in its 10th year of production, so perhaps you might like to hear some changes or have us create content that better reflects your interest in the history of early America. You can help us better understand you and what you're looking for from this podcast by taking our listener survey at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. At benfranklinsworld.com slash survey, you can tell us if you love this podcast whether you think the time warp or other elements of the show need to be refreshed or updated, and whether you might be interested in a video component to the show. This survey is also the place where the team and I can learn more about you. We create this podcast for you, and we want to serve you as best we can, so please help us out by taking our listener survey. benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. All right. Are you ready to dive into the worlds of Phyllis Wheatley and playwrights? Allow me to introduce you to our expert guide. Our guest is an award-winning playwright and screenwriter. She's the founder and director of Spora Stories, which tells stories of the African diaspora through plays, films, debates, and other events. She's also the author of Phyllis in London, a play about Phyllis Wheatley's experiences as an African woman writer abroad in Georgian London. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Ade Sholanka. Hi, Liz. Thank you so much for having me. 2023 marked the 250th anniversary of Phyllis Wheatley's book, Reflections on Various Subjects, Religious and Moral. Wheatley's book was published in London in 1773 and it was the first book of poetry published in English by an African. Ade, would you provide us with an overview of who Phyllis Wheatley was and how she became a poet? So Phyllis is the first African to publish a book of poetry in English. And I always do stress the in English because obviously there's a very well-known oral tradition in Africa, especially West Africa, where she was kidnapped from. But there is also a literary tradition And she was from an area around the Senegambia region, which was quite famous for poetry, written poetry, especially of the kind that she grew to specialize in, the elegy, 
So it's obviously worth remarking on her as a trailblazer, and her book was certainly a landmark. But sometimes people do think it's just the moment when African writing begins, and that's something we really have to debunk. It's African writing in English and the poetic tradition. So she was a child when she was kidnapped, around seven, we think, from, as I said, the Senegambia region. And she was brought to Boston in 1761 on a slave ship called the Phyllis. And the enslavers who purchased her, John and Susanna Wheatley, named her after the ship, the Phyllis. And Phyllis, having been born and raised in Africa, arrived as so many millions did, unable to speak any English. And within a few years was so prodigious, her talent was so remarkable, she was writing and very quickly writing poetry. Fortunately for her, you know, often any talent that was seen wasn't cultivated or nurtured or acknowledged by enslavers. But in her case, Susanna Wheatley especially took a shine to her and helped develop her work. The Wheatley family had brother and sister twins. Nathaniel and Mary were 18-year-olds when Phyllis was bought and enslaved. And Nathaniel was at Harvard. He was helping to teach Phyllis reading and writing alongside Mary Wheatley and Mrs. Wheatley, Susanna Wheatley. So her circumstances were quite unusual. I always stress again that it wasn't so much that she had this you know, genius or talent, but she was in an environment which thankfully cultivated and nurtured it rather than completely stamped it out. I always also say nobody went to kidnap Africans for poetry, but in her case, remarkably, she was able to use her talent. Yeah, the Wheatleys certainly seem to be a bit unusual in their focus on teaching Phyllis literary skills and encouraging those literary skills as she practiced them. As you mentioned, enslavers weren't in the business of encouraging the genius and talent that they saw in their enslaved people. They worked to stamp it out because they were so focused on the manual labor aspects of enslaved people yes. and what that manual labor could do to better provide for their household and their businesses. So yes, they would, again, teaching her to read and write in English. We can't assume that she couldn't read or write. Literacy was quite advanced in the region she came from. And as you probably know, at that point, there were more cities in Africa than there were in colonial America in those 13 colonies. So African civilization and culture, especially in West Africa, which is actually where my parents are from. My parents are from Nigeria, which is a few countries down the coast. So she came from a highly cultured and cultivated environment. But yes, I think the Wheatleys are unusual. And there's obviously the relationship between Phyllis and Susanna was something that I explored in my recent play, Phyllis in Boston, where the Wheatleys were not enslavers, they were not abolitionists, but Susanna Wheatley, according to some of the biographies of Phyllis, had lost three children, actually, by the time Phyllis was brought to America, enslaved in America. And one of her daughters would have been the same age Phyllis was when she was around seven when she came to America. And it has been speculated, you know, historians never know the exact reality of all sorts of elements in the periods there and the personalities they're exploring. But it does seem feasible that Susanna projected some of the feelings for her lost child onto Phyllis, because it definitely was the case that their bond was quite strong. When Susanna died, Phyllis referred to her as my mother, my sister, like a best friend. Now, those are very strange words to hear from someone who's been kidnapped and enslaved. And it was, again, reciprocal. Susanna Wheatley was very, very invested in Phyllis. There are a lot of interesting details to Phyllis Wheatley's story. What about those details drew you to write plays about her? Was it the fact that she lived this unusual life as both an enslaved person and a poet and also a surrogate daughter? So this is, in a way, the gift that keeps on giving. I started out with a project called Phyllis in London. I first heard about Phyllis when I was, and this is quite important in terms of my real deep engagement with her story. When I was an African woman writer abroad, I was a student at USC on a Fulbright Fellowship 20 odd years ago. And that's when I first heard about her. And the immediate thing that chimed in my mind was, oh, we're both African women writers abroad. Now, our lives couldn't be more different. I was born in London. My parents came to study in the 60s. And I've grown up in this environment my whole life. I've never actually lived in Africa. She was born and raised in Africa. And as I've just said, was brought to America as an enslaved child. And actually, it was quite unusual for children to be kidnapped. So the fact she survived is also remarkable. As we know, the Middle Passage is a horrendous, arduous trauma, but she managed to survive it, which was lucky for her and for us. But the first connection was on the level of being African women writers abroad. 
I'm interested in artists. And she's, again, unusually from that period, as you said, most Africans were brought to labor, menial and manual labor. So her story interested me because it was so unusual. But also I wanted to explore the different phases of her reputation. Because in the 60s and 70s, she was actually dismissed and actually quite vilified because she was seen as being too accommodating, too kind, you know, calling her enslaver like her mother. And she was basically dismissed as an Aunt Jemima type figure. And that intrigued me because I thought, well, hang on a minute. None of us were there in 1773. Let's dig into this and explore what her reality was. The reason she was so unpopular with black nationalists and the ferment of the 60s and 70s was because of one particular poem. Henry Louis Gates called it the most reviled poem in the African-American tradition. And the poem is called On Being Brought from Africa to America. And the lines that caused so much controversy were the opening lines, "'Twas mercy saved me from my pagan land. And the rest of the poem ostensibly is praising, thanking her enslavers. And again, when I first read those lines, I was a bit aghast. I thought, oh, I'm not sure about this, Phyllis. But, you know, for me, it was about exploring her reality. And in fact, a lot of this project has led to this transformation in my attitude and thinking to really enter someone else's experience and not judge them as much as perhaps in my youth. As I've grown, obviously, there's different levels to every experience. So I was intrigued also because she had been dismissed and condemned, actually, as a sellout. And I wanted to explore what that actually meant as someone who was not the only person writing in her era. I'm sure there were other writers we haven't heard about. But she was certainly nurtured and promoted in a way that no one else of that period, actually even after her life, it didn't happen for many, many decades that another writer came into the scene. So, you know, Phyllis is a huge and complete and utter anomaly. That for me as a player is intriguing. I can only imagine what it must have felt like to be in her position. She was told not to mix with other enslaved people. She was kept separate. And I can only imagine the pressures of that. In a way, you're given a certain level of status, but you're still an enslaved woman. So at the same time as she's a renowned poet who's been celebrated, not just in New England, but in England, when she comes to London to publish her book in June of 1773, she's the toast of the town. She's fated as the lit girl of the moment. But at the same time, being a celebrity, she's enslaved. She's owned as property. Her material is being published in the colonial pamphlets and tracts and newspapers which are screeching, and I use that word deliberately, about tyranny and likening the colonists to Parliament slaves. And her poetry has been published alongside these screeds, which are being written by people who are pro-slavery. So again, a very complex and rich sea of interests and actions to dramatize. I wonder if we could go a bit deeper into your interest in Phyllis Wheatley and talk about your work as a playwright. You're familiar with this podcast, so you know we normally speak with professional historians, curators, archivists, and people who just do a lot of historical research into the time periods, peoples, and places that we discuss in our interviews. And you're a trained playwright, and yet you also seem very knowledgeable about the life and times of Phyllis Wheatley. Would you talk about how you approach creating dynamic stories about the African diaspora and how you know what you know about the past? So, What is your historical process and research process like? My job is to create an emotional experience for audiences who come for a couple of hours to be entertained. And I mean entertained in the etymological origins of the word, to hold their attention. So I'm not a historian, although obviously I'm very grateful to the many historians who've researched Phyllis's life. There have been three main biographies, but as you know, Phyllis has been written about in lots of different ways. Young adult novels. Young people are always inspired by her story because she was so young when she was producing literature and art. And again, while she was enslaved. So I've been extremely fortunate that those historians have done such heavy lifting, basically. And I've obviously used their material, but that's not what I'm offering the audience. And in fact, the play that we've just finished, Phyllis in Boston, by the time we finished rehearsals, a lot of the historical information, which I found so fascinating. A lot of it had come out because we found that you don't want a play to be stuffed full of historical information. 
it's not information that makes a play sing. What makes a play sing, and this is, as you mentioned, it's what I've been trained to do, is relationships. It's the characters. It's the way in which they behave towards each other. In fact, you could say that to an extent, drama is a study of human behavior. Now, that does come into historical accounts, but it's not the whole point of a historical account. So the whole point of a play is to engage an audience with the emotional journey of a character who's dealing with obstacles, and not just ordinary obstacles, often life-threatening obstacles. In Phyllis's case, in Phyllis in Boston, which is the play we've just finished, her massive challenge was that her books were on board a ship which was about to have its cargo dumped into the ocean. So 300 copies of her book were sent from London in the September of 1773. That's why it's the 250th anniversary. And they arrived in Boston on the 28th of November. But unfortunately, they were on board a certain vessel called the Dartmouth, along with 300 chests of East India Company tea. So there's a drama. The Patriots refused to allow the cargo to be offloaded. They swear that it will never be deposited on American soil. And they threaten anyone who tampers with this cargo does so on pain of death. So there is a drama. How is she going to get her books off? So there's lots of really interesting historical material around that basic dramatic crisis. But my focus, as we rehearsed and had to edit, was really, this is a young woman whose only hope of emancipation and freedom and of a life rests on her being able to get her books and selling them. And the books, it looks very imminently about to be thrown into the ocean. So how did she get her books off? Okay, so historians don't know the detail. All the books that you can look at speculate. There are certain facts of what happened in terms of the meetings, the body of the people led to, you know, lots of written material of an account of what was going on, Sam Adams' speeches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of that historical material is accessible. But I only draw on what's of use. There was a particular pronouncement where the body of the people basically issues a threat. And it's so vivid. It says, on pain of death, anyone who goes against our wishes will attract our wrath. So I don't have to make that up. It's already a huge enough obstacle for her to surmount. Now, how does she actually get her books off? We don't know. So my job is to imagine the most difficult, exciting, tense and dramatic, basically, way for those books to come off. So it sounds like you actually do a lot of historical research, mostly in what we call secondary sources, the books we talk about on this podcast that are written from actual firsthand accounts or contemporary accounts of a person, place, or an event. And while historians are always in the archives and libraries looking for information to fill in gaps in our historical knowledge, you as a playwright are actually looking for those gaps in our knowledge because there are moments where you can go in and speculate and imagine what might have happened because we don't historically know what happened. And then you use that gap, that unknowingness and curiosity to create a compelling work of art. That is a perfect way to put it. In fact, the dramas are in the gaps. Absolutely. It was Hilary Mantel, I think, who said, don't avoid the historical facts that you have that may not be convenient for the story. Lean into those facts that make the story from that. But at the same time, where there's an absence, nature hates a gap artists hate the gap. And yes, I think that metaphor is perfect. I'm looking to make a drama out of a crisis. And there was definitely not just Phyllis's personal crisis, but luckily for me, the backdrop is also quite critical because it's the run-up to the American Revolution. So she's in a really interesting time and place, book of poetry or not. And because she lives on King Street, which is just steps from the State House where the Boston Massacre took place, and because she's just around the corner from the Old South Meeting House, in her poetry, she writes about arguments around liberty. In fact, when she's in London, she experiences censorship because they are saying, hang on, this is England. We're not going to help you include this very, for them, seditious material supporting the colonists in their criticisms and quarrels with the Crown. So some of her poems are taken out. In the play Phyllis in London, I'd lean into that. What is it like to be censored? Because she's being censored because she aligns herself with the patriots. And people in England are saying, but these patriots, mm, they're not talking about your liberty. <laughs> they're talking about their liberty. Why do you support them? Again, that's what makes the drama rich. Speaking of this censorship, what was it like for Phyllis Wheatley in London? How did she experience the city? 
Normally, we hear stories of white Americans going abroad, and they're usually just really astonished at how big and noisy and crowded London is. And, you know, it's the seat of their British empire, and there always seems to be something going on. But Phyllis was a woman of color. So how did she experience London? And how did she react to the imperial capital of Great Britain when she arrived in 1773? Well, it's the third continent she stepped on. She'd obviously been born in Africa, trafficked to America, and now she's on a third continent. And this is something that I did discover as I was doing my research. Africans travel a lot, not by choice, but they're dragged here and there by the people who profess to own them. And she comes into a space where London in the 1770s is really beginning to show off the money that it's made from the slave trade in terms of cultural institutions, places like the Royal Academy, which was founded in 1768, just five years before she arrives. The British Museum, all of these massive, and today even still, cultural organizations are being funded by the proceeds from slavery. So in a sense, as I research the piece, what I'm discovering is, you know, the African contribution to English culture, which unfortunately we're not really taught in schools. You know, we're taught, oh, the Industrial Revolution just happened. We're not taught about the links to slavery in the Caribbean and in the North American colonies. So she comes into a space where London is alive and abuzz with the wealth of empire. So she comes into a London which has a very strong black presence. There's a wonderful book if your listeners are interested in finding more. England Before Emancipation by Greta Gertzino is her name. And I used that book with its wonderful information about people like Ignatius Sancho. Ignatius Sancho and his wife, they had a shop in Westminster. And he was well known in the era as a writer, as a composer. He was formerly enslaved. He'd been brought to England as a toddler, basically. And he actually was enslaved in Greenwich. So Phyllis, we know, came to London and went to Greenwich to visit the Painted Hall. And in my play, Phyllis in London, I imagine Sancho, who was raised in that area, taking her to the Painted Hall. That probably didn't happen. But we know that Sancho was very aware of her presence, very aware of her work. And one of the things that inspired me to write the play was a very short but quite powerful passage he wrote, excoriating the Wheatley, saying, well, here's this young woman. She's a genius. She's probably you know, more intelligent than you. And yet you keep her enslaved and parade her around London to flaunt yourself as virtuous Christians. So he was really quite critical of them. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Yes, because she is being used almost as a trophy. We're such good Christians. Look what we've done to help this poor little Negro poet. And again, as I said, there was this strong relationship and bond between Susanna and Phyllis. But I always say just because Susanna was good to Phyllis, does that make her a good person? She had four or five other enslaved people. The Wheatleys sent slave catchers after one of them when he ran away. So as I said, they weren't abolitionists by any stretch of the imagination. So Phyllis comes into a London, a really multicultural place, and she's meeting literary women who, for the first time, are beginning to assert themselves and find their voice, the blue stockings. So I invent relationships with Elizabeth Montagu, who's known as the Queen of the Blues, Hester Thrales, who was one of the leading society figures of the era. And they would run salons, these two women and others would run literary salons. Now, I'm a woman writer, uh, English heritage as well as African heritage. So I'm very interested in what the white women's literary scene was in that era. So Phyllis meets the Blue Stockings, and it's still very strange whenever I say it, but their project was to create an environment where women could converse on an equal basis with men. I mean, just imagine that 250 years ago, that was a big deal. In a day's play, Phyllis in London, There's a scene where Phyllis debates whether she should return to Boston and her enslavement with the Wheatleys or whether she should remain in this multicultural London as a free woman. A day, we have to take a moment to talk about our episode sponsor. When we return, I hope you'll tell us more about whether this was a scene that was informed by historical events or whether this is something from your imagination where you're creating drama for us. Playwrights like a day and poets like Phyllis Wheatley communicate history, current events, and emotion through their plays and poetry. But for most of us, communicating with friends, family, and coworkers likely takes the form of emails, text messages, and video calls. How do we know that our methods of electronic communication are safe and not being intercepted by unwanted third parties? The truth is, we can't know unless we're using a secure VPN service 
like NordVPN. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. NordVPN is a service that protects your connection to the internet and your online privacy by hiding the IP addresses that your devices use to communicate with the internet. NordVPN is an easy-to-use service that operates at a very fast speed, and you can use your NordVPN account on up to six devices, which means you can share your online protection with your family. NordVPN supports Macs, PCs, iPhones, and Androids, so no matter what your favorite device is, NordVPN will work with it. So if you're like me, you may be wondering at this point, why do I need a service like NordVPN? One of the reasons I like NordVPN is that, as I said, it protects my information and monitors whether my online credentials have been exposed to the black web. I also enjoy using NordVPN when I travel. Tim and I like to travel around the United States and abroad. Using NordVPN allows us to log into our streaming services so that we can enjoy watching our favorite sports teams, TV shows, and movies while we're waiting in airports or have some downtime. Get your exclusive NordVPN deal which includes a big discount plus four extra months free at nordvpn.com slash bfw. Your trial of NordVPN is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. Again, visit nordvpn.com slash bfw to get your exclusive discount and deal. That's nordvpn.com slash bfw. A day in your play, Phyllis in London, you feature a scene where Phyllis debates whether she should return to Boston and her enslavement with the Wheatleys or whether she should remain in multicultural London as a free woman. Was this scene something that you created where you imagined this internal debate that would have happened for Wheatley? Or do we have historical evidence suggesting and showing that Phyllis really did have this debate with herself and really question whether she should return to Boston with the Wheatleys, which really would have meant returning to her enslavement. Everyone in New England in 1772 knew of the Somerset case, a man from Massachusetts who'd been brought to London by, again, his so-called master, had left, and this was something that was happening all the time, people who were being brought here as servants, or they used the euphemism servants, but they were basically enslaved, were just leaving. Because in England, slavery, there was no official law authorizing slavery. Although it was practiced, and it was practiced in horrific ways in the Caribbean. So I don't want anyone to think, oh, the English were not party to the evil of slavery. And also, let's remember that the Americans were also British Americans. So when Phyllis comes in June of 73, it's against this backdrop, and every enslaved person in New England, and I think even further down the seaboard to the south, knew about the fact that James Somerset had been, with the help of Granville Sharp, a test case for whether an enslaved person who was brought to London, where there was no official law authorising slavery, could be forced to return. Lord Mansfield's verdict was no, and that meant James Somerset could stay in England, and it set a precedent. So Phyllis would have been aware of this, absolutely. As a literate person, she would have been reading all the papers, and that would have been a topic of conversation even before she left. Several of her biographers have mentioned that the Wheatleys, Susanna Wheatley in particular, in sending her to London, would have been totally aware that Phyllis could decide, I'm not coming back. And I do explore this as one of the dramatic questions that she's wrestling with while she's in London, because she was seeing it. Quite a few contemporary accounts attest to the fact that as soon as they hit the streets of London, enslavers would find their so-called property disappeared and people would just self-emancipate. It wasn't unusual. It was actually something that people were warning others when they returned to the colonies not to bring their slaves because the likelihood they would lose them. There was actually a man from South Carolina, Henri Laurens. There's a really interesting account of what happens with his young, the euphemism they used was servant, but he had a young enslaved man who was, I think in his teens, his name was Robert, and Robert just ran away. And there's a really interesting account of how Henri Lawrence tried to get this young man back and in the end managed to recapture him and I think sent him to the Caribbean. So yes, Phyllis would have definitely been aware of that legal precedent and that technically, as soon as she set foot in England, she was free. Do the historical sources reveal why Phyllis decided to return to Boston and her enslavement? Well, that's what the play's about. And I've again imagined you're in a foreign land, whatever your circumstances are in Boston, 
you do know people, you now know the terrain. And as I said, she was part of a community there. I imagine, and again, I don't know, but maybe the prospect of starting again in a new space would have been daunting. And as much as she was celebrated, as we know from today, you know, how long does celebrity last? And would she, would I have wanted to be totally on my own? Would I have wanted to be in a big, noisy, you know, Colonial Boston is only what, 15,000 people? Thousand, roughly under a thousand are African. In London in the 1770s, it's like 100,000 people. It's noisy. I think accounts, as you've said, of Americans and Caribbean colonists who come to the big city in that era, they find it bewildering, baffling. Also, let's not also forget, she's been through a lot of trauma. The Middle Passage, only on her ship, the ship Phyllis, 95 people, I think, were on board when it left the coast of Africa. I think only 70-something. So a third, and that's the standard amount, a third of the people who were kidnapped died. And, you know, she was seven years old. When do you get over that kind of horror? Do you ever? I just marvel at the fact that she could find the mental strength and focus to write poetry, having been through such an ordeal. And I also think her relationship with Susanna was a factor. Susanna had treated her, on the whole, like a daughter. She still had to do some domestic work, but she was very frail. Again, part of the impact of the Middle Passage was health issues, which plagued her for the rest of her life. So I think she returned for a variety of reasons. And I'm, yes, you're right, speculating. But I'm also interested in the question, what would I have done? I'm trying to imagine myself back in 1773. Now, what about Wheatley's poetry? Would you talk to us about Phyllis's poetry, which may have been an outlet for the trauma you just mentioned of her having experienced the Middle Passage? So could you tell us more about her poetry, perhaps even your favorite poem, and what she was writing about as she composed her verse? Yeah, that's a good question, because she didn't actually use her poetry. We think of poetry today as very confessional about exploring your innermost thoughts and feelings. But her poetry was very public. As you know, she was famed for writing elegies dedicated to named specific people, often well-known white men and women in colonial Boston, because the Wheatleys were part of the elite of Boston. So through those family connections, she knew many clergy. She knew Samson Oakham through the Wheatleys. She was aware of George Whitfield, the evangelical who was one of the leading lights of the Great Awakening. So through the Wheatley, she's very connected. John Hancock is friends with Mr. Wheatley. So she's writing about people she knows. A lot of her poems are elegies, not just to adults, but to unfortunately, we know what child mortality was like in those days. Elegies to young kids who pass away before their time. I don't really have a favorite poem as such, but one of the pieces we did very recently at the Boston Public Library is to SM, a young African painter. And SM stands for, we think, Scipio Moorhead, who is the young African, and I mean very young, teenaged African painter who is credited with having done the frontispiece for her book. And it's very unusual, as you know, at that time to have a frontispiece to a living author. It's very unusual. But she has one, apparently at the request of her sponsor, the Countess of Huntington, who'd requested an image of Phyllis. And so one had been done before she left Boston for London. It was sent to London. And then she has a frontispiece in her book. And the poem is dedicated to this SM, probably Scipio Moorhead. And I find that so touching. She's a teenage artist, applauding, saluting, praising another young artist. Her poetry isn't about herself. She refers to her father in one poem and how awful, anguished and traumatized he must have been having his child snatched away from him. She writes a little bit about Africa, but not much. It's very much about politics. She's actually engaged as a commentator on the issues of the day. The day, what do you hope people will take away from watching plays like Phyllis in London or Phyllis in Boston that might help them better understand historical people, places and events? Well, as I said at the beginning, my job is entertainment. And entertainment for me is not a dirty word. I know it is for some people. Because I think entertainment means, oh, distraction, pretty people and cheesy plots and sitcom laughter. Nothing wrong with sitcoms, by the way. I do enjoy them. But do you know what I mean? Entertainment as a distraction from more 
serious or important topics. I think of entertainment as, and it's especially important to answer your question, when we're dealing with untold stories and hidden histories. And unfortunately, not just in America, but in England, a drive to actually ban the memory of certain moments in history and figures like Phyllis. It's desperately important that we tell these stories, that we remember people like Phyllis, that we explore the legacies of slavery, which unfortunately are with us in England, definitely. We see the ongoing repercussions of slavery in all sorts of areas, health, education, employment, law, policing, all of these areas of everyday life have the residue of the moment when people were being kidnapped and enslaved. So as we look at and pursue more equity, more fairness is really what it boils down to in society. I don't know how we can do that without looking at what caused the structural imbalance in the first place. So by looking back, it's actually a way of understanding better the situation we live in today and more importantly, helping us to think of ways to create a fairer society for all. It's time for the time warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. opinion, what might have happened if Phyllis Wheatley had decided not to return to Boston as a 19-year-old? How do you think the remaining years of her life would have been different if Phyllis had stayed in London? Wow, I can imagine that she must have. And in fact, one of my plays, which is looking at her after the book's published and during the war, is exploring that very question. Would there have been some regret about leaving, being a celebrity in London? I imagine so. What would her life have been like? Well, poetry, as I said, was the revered art form. She was the only one who was being promoted and published. As I say, we don't know that she was the only African woman writing. I'm sure there were others, but she was certainly the only one who had an international profile. I think she was called the most famous African in the world in her era, in that point in the 1770s. So I imagine she had patronage. She had very powerful sponsors, not just the Countess of Huntington, who had funded her book. But one of the people she stayed with during her visit was John Thornton, a businessman, thankfully not in the business of human trafficking. But he was the second most wealthy man in the whole of Europe. And she stayed with him in South London in Clapham. So she was connected enough to have made a life for herself. But now as then, the world of literature is a fickle one. So there was never any guarantee that her career would have had any longevity, just as today there's no guarantee of a successful writer today being celebrated three, four years down the line. So I imagine she would have done well because she's very shrewd. She had, my mum always used to say, there's two types of intelligence, book intelligence, book sense and human sense. She was clearly someone who was able to get people to like and support her. When she met Lord Dartmouth in London, who had just a few months previously been appointed as Secretary of State for the Commonwealth, he gives her a half an hour audience. It's not just a quick hello and goodbye. He sits and has a conversation. When Ben Franklin returns to London from France, he comes to visit her. She meets Brooke Watson, who is the well-known businessman, and a little bit later becomes the Lord Mayor of London. She's fated. People are coming to see her, to celebrate her. So I think she had the sense and the charisma to not just attract that kind of interest, but to cultivate and develop it. She would have done all right in London. A day, for those of us who would really like to see your plays, Phyllis in London and Phyllis in Boston, how can we see them? Well, I'm sorry, but you've just missed Phyllis in Boston, which was on at Old South Meeting House as part of their Revolution 250 celebrations. Because as I mentioned earlier, her books were brought to America on board the Dartmouth, one of the Tea Party ships. We had the play on for five weeks, so it's possible that some of your listeners who are interested in history may be aware of what the program is at Old South Meeting House. Phyllis in London, now that the Boston play is finished, I'm now focusing on that, and it will be on in London probably around June. 
because I want it to be the culmination of this year of celebrating and memorializing Phyllis. The book was published in September of 73. So we're doing a whole year up until September of 74, honoring her, basically. So I want the play to be on in June because that's when she arrived in London. But we're also, I'm doing lots of talks and your listeners can follow what we're doing on my website, Phyllis Wheatley's LondonAdventure.com. And will your plays ever be available online for digital viewing? Yes, probably. In fact, Faces of Phyllis, which we did with the associates of the Boston Public Library, there'll be highlights of that presentation. Two scenes, one which was looking at her relationship with Scipio Moorhead, the young artist. People did say they found it moving, and I'm happy that that was the case because that was my intention. Another scene looking at her roughly 10 years after the book is published and the war is still raging. And she, along with others, have had to evacuate Boston. She's now living in Middleton in the country, Middleton, Massachusetts. And unfortunately, she's lost two children and is pregnant with a third. So going through another really challenging moment, her life was full of lots of struggle. Again, for a dramatist, that's material that we can work with. But it's looking at how friends and family help her through those really challenging times. And there'll be highlights of those two pieces on the Associates of Boston Public Library website. Would you tell us the web address for your website again so that we can follow your work? My Phyllis project over the last year has been on phyllisweetleyslondonadventure.com. My other website is sporastories.com. Adesha Lanka, thank you for sharing what you know about Phyllis Wheatley and for taking us behind the scenes and how playwrights use history to tell engaging stories. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for such excellent questions. And I hope your listeners enjoy our conversation. I certainly have. Phyllis Wheatley led a remarkable life. Her elegies and poetry allowed her to flatter famous people while also giving her space on a public platform where she could comment on the current events and politics of her day. And she had a lot of support for her literary work. I find this element of Wheatley's life and work interesting and remarkable because Phyllis was an enslaved African woman, a teenager, and yet her enslavers encouraged her literary talents and the British public praised her even as she had some really critical things to say about the practice of slavery and British imperial governance over the colonies. Now, this is not to say that all Britons accepted and lauded Phyllis. They didn't. Thomas Jefferson quite famously derided Phyllis in her poetry, and he wasn't the only person to do so. Still, a lot of people read and considered Phyllis's work, and the British government thought that some of her ideas about freedom and liberty were dangerous enough and that her audience would be big enough that they censored some of her poems. Now, our conversation with the day wasn't just about Phyllis Wheatley's life and work. It was also about how playwrights use history to create dramatic works of art. Ade talked about how playwrights rely on the work of historians and primary historical sources to locate moments of historically accurate drama, moments such as the Boston Tea Party, and they also look for gaps in our historical knowledge where they can then create the space for history-informed, imagined drama. For example, we don't know what conversations Phyllis might have had with herself about returning to Boston and her enslavement, but it is fair to speculate that Phyllis did experience some internal debate about this subject. And while historians might point out the likeliness that Phyllis experienced this internal debate, they would leave it to readers, museum goers, and listeners to wonder what that debate may have sounded like, because we don't have strong evidence or historical sources that shows us the questions that Phyllis asked of herself. Meanwhile, playwrights like Ade and Lin-Manuel Miranda dig into these unknown moments and work to point out the drama and tension of the situation in ways that can help us better empathize and understand historical people like Phyllis Wheatley. These dramatic works of art can be quite fun and compelling to watch. We just have to remember that playwrights and actors take artistic license, like filling in the gaps of our knowledge with compelling imaginations. So while these works reflect some historical truth, they aren't always 100% historically accurate. But like accurate histories, historically-based plays provide us with a method to understand the past in more emotional and empathetic ways, ways that can help us better understand who we are and how we came to be who we are as people, and how we can make the world a better place for the next generation. You'll find more information about a day, her plays, plus notes, links, and a transcript for everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 377. Don't forget to tell us what you think about Ben Franklin's world. 
please help the Innovation Studios team and me better serve you with this podcast by taking our listener survey at benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. That's benfranklinsworld.com slash survey. Production assistance for this podcast comes from my colleagues at Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios, Katie Schinebeck, Ashley Bachnight, and Ian Tonat. Breakmaster Cylinder composed our custom theme music. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. To discover and listen to their other podcasts, visit airwavemedia.com. Finally, what do you think about historical plays? Have you been to see one that you really enjoyed? Tell me about your experience. I'd love to know. Liz at benfranklinsworld.com. Ben Franklin's World is a production of Colonial Williamsburg Innovation Studios.